right. Guys, it's time to get rolling. Uh, I think I got enough to fill uh, uh, the, the next 40 minutes. Uh, if we, if I need extra time or um, or I finish early, maybe we'll roll into absolutism or talk about talk about the Renaissance again. I can't hurt. Goal today is to go over Reformation and exploration. Uh, this is not me putting up the old PowerPoint slides and flipping through them all. I'm not throwing all the mini little facts at you. I'm going to try and uh, and 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 group everything together. The reason I think these reviews are so important is because we're going to look at the overall eras. Okay, we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to condense the Reformation down into 15, 20 minutes. Talk about some of the details, but ultimately, the reason I chose it as a timeline is because um, I, we've got to see how these different eras over overact. Uh, you know, the first the first five chapters of this uh, of this unit are basically. Um, basically the same time period. Don't move. <laughs> so to start out with, so to start out with, let's look at the clusters, all right? Era before the Reformation, is uh, the Renaissance. Remember what our clusters are for the Renaissance. What, what, what does everything tie into at Renaissance? Humanism, right? Everything ties into humanism, okay? Um, I, 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 maybe you could argue new knowledge, but I think it's too generic. I think humanism is our answer. For the Reformation, let me get a guess. What's our cluster? What's the whole era about? Uh, religion, sure. Too generic, but it's, it's going to be on that. I think... And this is me making it up. If you come up with different ideas, that's fine. I think challenging authority. I think challenging authority is the biggest one. Uh, there's a lot of errors that that are gonna that are gonna that are gonna include this idea, so we can synthesize. Uh, what authority are we gonna challenge primarily? Roman Catholic Church, not just church. Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Who else's authority are we gonna challenge? Uh, rulers, we are. It, it, and not even that, I think we're going to challenge the status quo. Okay? So status quo includes the rulers. What else does it include? The Say it again? The estates. Uh, the estates, right? That's getting ahead of ourselves. That's French rev, but that's exactly what's happening. What are we challenging here? Besides the ruler, why do I have a problem? You know. Social class. Nobles, sure, because the nobles are the clergy, right? So we're going to go after the power of the, of the priest. The fact that priests have run society since the Middle Ages, that authority, that status quo, <laughs> is going to be one of the targets of this. And finally, I think religious conflict. I hope to come up with one cluster, so I think challenging the status quo of the Roman Catholic Church is, is probably it. But, but religious conflict is, is a big part of our key concepts, okay? And if you don't know what I did, basically is I went through all the key concepts for the, re uh, for the uh, Reformation, which I don't know if this is helpful at all, but what you have in this packet is all the key concepts from the first half of class. This is the same thing that you did your midterm review on, right? Um, but if you go to the, the next page, uh, Chapter 14, Reformation, Religious Wars, I took all of that and I threw it onto uh, this this timeline so we can roll. The Renaissance Reformation, I think it's actually the first, the, it might be the first point of this, all right, is that the inventing of the printing press is super duper important, all right? When was the printing press? Well, I, I don't want to ask you 45 questions. We'll never get there. 1450-ish. I'm going to have a lot of dates up here. You don't need to have the dates. When they are is not as important. What I want to see is how they overlap, okay? You guys got these clusters down? Fourteen fifty is the printing press. Guy in charge was Gutenberg. Not the first, but the first European, and the guy really gets credit for it. Why is the the printing press so significant to the to the Protestant Reformation? Because say it again. It spreads literacy, which is is a fancy way of saying more people can read. And why is regular people 
being able to read Why is regular people being able to read so important to challenging the status quo? If you're going to take down priests, if you're going to take down kings, right? You have to be able to read the ideas of people who aren't priests or kings, right? We just talked about Nazi Germany and the fact that, that uh, uh, Goebbels, using propaganda, he controls the media, he controls the newspapers, the, 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 the movie theaters. He is able to control the minds of the people until people can read in the 14 and really the 1500s. The, the, the society will not be able to challenge the traditional readers. Okay? The, the, the printing press is most important to our big date in, uh, in Reformation, which you should know, 1517-95 Theses. Right? So Gutenberg, I think, is where we have to start. Press. All right, and we get to the actual Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation, I would always put, let's say, you know, right before the 1500s or 1500s, and it goes all the way, I don't know, to the mid to late 1500s, is the Protestant Reformation. Okay, Protestant Reformation. The guy who starts it, the guy who gets the credit, the guy who's most important here is Martin Luther. Now, he challenged the Church of 95 Thesis. He's famous for challenging for uh, indulgences, right? Challenging for indulgences is the idea that priests can sell uh, rights to heaven to regular people. They can sell the rights to heaven. Okay? Uh, that's not all he challenged, and really it's not our biggest point. Protestant reformers in general are going to challenge the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, which means they are going to attack what people in charge of the Roman Catholic Church? Who's in charge of the Roman Catholic Church? Pope. And at the local level, it's a priest. Okay? Do you guys remember the word anti-clericalism? Anti-clericalism is the key to most of the Protestant challenges. Right? Protestant Reformation argues that the priest, these special people that you could argue, or they would argue at the time, the status quo would tell you, a priest is a better human being in the eyes of God. They are more important than others in the eyes of God because they can determine how many sins you die with. Martin Luther has a problem with this. Okay, And what is his source? What is his source? To prove that he's right. The Bible. the Bible. And what's our quote? I told you to remember five months ago and never forget. Faith alone. Grace alone. Scripture alone. Faith alone. Grace alone. Scripture alone. According to Martin Luther, according to the Roman Catholic Church in the 1500s, where do you learn about the rules of God? No. No. The priests in mass. The priests will teach you what's good, what's bad, right? The, how many Catholic? How, remember we talked about uh, the sacraments, right? There's seven sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church: marriage, baptism, anointing the sick, uh, um, the, 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 all this other junk, right? In a Bible, there's two or three. I know baptism and Eucharist. I think there's two, right? But the other ones are made up by the church. Martin Luther says we can't do that because the church has, is abusing their powers. The reason he doesn't like priests besides indulgences, do you guys remember uh, 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 nepotism? Nepotism is a great word. Nepotism means putting your, uh, your family, putting your family in positions of authority. Right? So priests are giving out you know, these very cherished roles to family members and friends, or they are selling them. The big one, though, besides indulgences and, nep and, 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 and nepotism, is pluralism. Pluralism is when a priest holds a position in multiple places. Why would a priest want to be priest of London and, uh, and duchess or duke of, of Saxony? They get paid twice, right? I would love to be a teacher here at Anderson and Madeira. 
because I would get paid three times the salary. But it leads to absenteeism. Absenteeism. And where am I going to spend most of my time? What, what, which school am I going to spend most of my time at? Madeira. Because they're it's slightly higher. I could pay more. I'm, I'm never going to be here. Sorry, bye. Right? Because of pluralism and because I can make more money, absenteeism, I'm just not going to be here. Right? This is all challenging the status quo. This is all challenging authority or church authority. All right? The role of the priests in, in Martin Luther's, do you guys remember we, we talked about the, the, the Eucharist? Okay? The Roman Catholic Church believes in transubstantiation. That means what happens to the bread and the wine. It physically and actually turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And how, to this day, how does the, the bread and the wine turn into the body and the blood? The priest says Mass, holds the Eucharist, and boom, turns it. You cannot, you cannot celebrate the Eucharist without an ordained minister. In Martin Luther's idea, in Lutherism, in most Protestantism today, it is the idea in spirit, that Jesus is there in spirit, and Jesus comes, do you remember the term, to wherever a gathering of his believers are, they call it a priesthood of believers. Martin Luther is literally taking the role of the priest and taking it from the elites, ending the status quo, taking it from the rich and powerful, and giving it to regular people. And people can take it. And people can young, uh, hold the Eucharist in, in Protestantism, a big part of it, because now, by the 1500s, they can do what? Read. Read. Before 1450, priests had to be the sole authority on religion. Why? Nobody else can read the Bible. You can't have grace, you can't have scripture alone as part of your statement if people can't read the Bible and interpret it for themselves. It's impossible. It can't be part of the religion. All right. So uh, the, the, the Protestants don't believe in the, pro, in the Pope, right? They, they don't believe in that whole church hierarchy. Uh, do, do, uh, salvation, right? Faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. Um, authority in the Protestantism comes from the Bible. Priesthood of believers, transubstantiation, I think that's good. John Calvin is another ruler you should know. What was John Calvin like compared? What was John Calvin like compared to uh, Martin Luther? Yeah, he, he's more radical. Okay, uh, John Calvin makes a model society. You remember where? Geneva. Geneva, right? Where he is going to kind of structure people's life based on religion. So, do 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 do. One of the other. Oh, in response to this, the Roman Catholic Church does what? They have their Catholic Reformation. If you had to summarize a Catholic Reformation, you would say this. The Catholic Reformation is the church trying to take back control. The primary result of the Protestant Reformation is that people leave the Roman Catholic Church. They leave. So the Catholic Reformation tries to change. What's the highlight of the Catholic Reformation? The Council of Trent, what's the year? 14, the 1540s. 1540s to 1560s. Let's just say the 1550s. The Council of Trent. It is the definition of the, pro, of, of, of the Catholic Re, uh, Reformation. What do they do with the Council of Trent? They admit some wrongdoings. They get rid of indulgences. They get rid of pluralism. They get rid of absenteeism. We talked about canceling the brothels, all that other good stuff, right? They fix many aspects of the church. They don't get any of the Protestants back to the church, but they stop a lot of them from leaving. Which is important, because at the end of this era, we now in Europe have two dominant religions. Roman Catholicism has dominated Europe for 500 years, and now <coughs> it's not the only religion. And that's going to lead us towards our last cluster. What's that? Religious conflict. Okay. In the, in the uh, Catholic Reformation, we created some groups, right? We talked about, uh, we talked about Ursuline. The Ursuline Order of Nuns. Right? What's the famous one for men? Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola, important guy, white box guy, created a white box group, the Jesuits. Jesuits are about education and spreading their religion. Because 
The Roman Catholic Church lost Europe. A lot of these Jesuits are going to travel where and try and convert people? The New World. And that's why if you go to Mexico today, you see Roman Catholics all over the place. Yeah. What's what? Ignatius Loyola created the Jesuits. Some other groups. Another thing is we had a, we had a big war. We had a big war. Uh, let me say this. The last thing I want to say, we can call it a, 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 a cluster, I'll write it up here, is state control. A lot of states tried to retake control of their country. Many states use religion to rule their country. The Habsburgs are a great example. The Habsburgs use religion to rule Austria. Okay? But in 1555, to settle a war, to settle a war that all these Protestants are rising up. Why does the, Rome, why does the Habsburg Empire have so many problems with uh, Protestants more than other countries? That's where it started. That, it, that's where it started. Holy Roman Empire includes Germany at this time. Well, there's so many arguments that arise because the Habsburg ruler says, no, you can't be Protestant, it's illegal. That eventually he has to sign the Peace of Augsburg. Remember the Peace of Augsburg? That's a white box term. What it did is it's a treaty that said you may, you may worship whatever religion your local king selects. So it's not quite perfect individual liber uh, liberty, but you have a thousand local kings. So it makes Protestantism legal, which is really bad for what old political authority? The Roman Catholic Church, but more so in, in the Holy Roman Empire. It's bad for the Habsburgs. That's why this whole year has been the story about the Habsburgs tanking. Right? They are on a consistent downfall until 1917. When, uh, when, when remember, Franz Ferdinand dies in 14, and that's the end of, of the Habsburgs. It all starts here at the Peace of Augsburg. Other state controls. Ursuline, Ignatius, Council of Trent, got all that, got all that, got all that. Um, you can throw in one of the most religious countries, and you know they're most religious because they did this really early, Spanish Inquisition. Finding Jews and Muslims and not Christians and, and getting rid of them one way or the other. Spanish Inquisition is state control. Uh, say it again. Uh, before 1500, 1400s. Also, and this is why I like... This is why I like the timeline. I think it's important. If, if we look at politics, guys, what's going on 1558 to 1600, 1603? Elizabeth. That's Elizabeth. The Virgin Queen. Her biggest problem when she steps in and takes control of her country, number one, that she's a woman. Number two, what's going on in England? What did her father... Henry VIII do? Henry VIII created the Anglican Church because he was sick of the political, political control that the Pope had. Right? So what she has to deal with Protestants and Catholics. And what she says is, stop fighting each other or I'll kill you. You can worship however you want. <coughs> okay? Elizabeth has great, great um, political control. Two other things. Number one, we have to talk about general morality. This whole time, morality changes. It's kind of like that constant force. Like, ah, kids these days, right? It's all prostitutes and brothels, and they're marrying later. So there's, uh, there's these carnivals, there's, there's sex before marriage, all this other junk. A lot of countries start to regulate it, right? They have stricter rules on sex. I would throw in one guy who really tried to fix the morality problem was John Calvin. And to give the example, he set up. He set up his council, his his city at Geneva, where everything was strict. Remember that there was no dancing; you could be you could be lashed for dancing. It was progressive in some ways. Do you remember women were taught to read by most Protestants, which is very liberal, very new. But the reason most women were taught to read is because to make them re to, to make them read the Bible and possibly teach their children how to read the Bible. That was the primary goal, so not a huge advancement. The ultimate sign that we had a, a that, that Europe thought they had a morality problem is in the 1500s, we saw the highest spike 
in witch hunts in modern Europe. People were so worried about religion and morality that, that primarily women were targeted. But, in general, you would have to say that by the time you get to the end of it, women are taking a step up. And the primary reason by the time we get to the late 1500s, women are moving up in society is why? Possibly because of Protestantism. But it's because of the most important woman, in my opinion, in European history. You have a, not just a queen, but a queen of what? The most powerful country in European history. And how does she do? Really, really well. And she never does what? She never marries. Last thing I want to talk about is religious conflict. There's a lot of conflict. We talked about the conflict in, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire that ends with the Peace of Augsburg and settles things down. Um, the most famous country with religious conflict, though, is France. Most famous country with religion conflict is France. What's a French Protestant called? Remember the Huguenots? Right? And France is traditionally a very what country? It's very conservative and very Catholic. We know that because one of the estates, the first estate that we're eventually going to, going to overthrow 100 years, no, 200 years from now, is the clergy. Right? So the Huguenots have a big problem. The, uh, the, 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 the kings outlaw Protestantism. They go back and forth. Eventually, a couple people named Catherine de Medici and Henry the Sixth, Henry the Fourth, have a big issue. Uh, I think it's Henry the Fourth's uh, marriage. That what happens? Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre. Saint uh, Bart's Day massacre, which is a bunch of Catholics, I believe, murdering Protestants. Doesn't matter. It's this explosion of violence. And like the Peace of Augsburg, which made Protestant legal in the Holy Roman Empire, what does Henry IV do for France? The Edict of Nantes, right? Where he says, religion, any religion, is legal now. Any major questions on any major questions on the ref, on the Reformation? Seriously. I think that's everything. So I would put right up here, changing the status quo. In this case, you are changing the Roman Catholic Church and you're changing Christianity's domination. You're changing its domination over Europe. You're changing its domination over the country. Right? Possible synthesis. I mean, we've only talked about Elizabeth in a religious sense. We can talk about her in a dozen other. Edict of Nantes is smart and good for the people because it settles down the conflict. But if you're a king, why can Edict of Nantes be a bad thing? You've got your people divided, right? And let's say you're a king that wants to convince people that you are chosen by God to rule. Why is the Edict of Nantes a bad thing? Not everyone will believe it. Not everyone will believe it because they don't know which God you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is much more effective to rule if everybody is in the same religion. And that's one reason that in the late 1600s, what happens with the Edict of Nantes? It gets revoked by whom? Louis the Fourteenth, in one of his steps toward absolute power, he says it's going to be a lot easier to rule if everybody's Catholic. Not only is everybody Catholic, but more importantly, the Roman Catholic Church is going to support the heck out of him because he ended this edict of not bull poopery. Other questions? Let's do exploration. That one's a little bit simpler. Let me give you the time. I got about 10 minutes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I said I'll get you chatted here at 710. So it's 7. Okay. What's the time period for exploration? It's the same.
Exploration is kind of uh, science, right? So what comes before exploration? The Renaissance. Renaissance. What comes after exploration? Scientific. Maybe scientific revolution. I think you can definitely argue that, but really, they happen at the same time. What era that's kind of like exploration comes later? No. Imperialism. Imperialism. After we discover all these new places and cultures, let's, white Europeans, go ahead and take them over. And we'll exploit them. Right? And why are we interested in exploiting them? That's one of the big parts. All right? So I think the, uh, the, the scientific challenge, I, I don't know how else to say it. Scientific, ch ch scientific advancement. Most of what we do is about scientific advancement. And the, the last thing, the other cluster, is about cultures, cultures interact. Guys, if it hits 710, please say something and I'll let you out of here. I know you got, you got class and stuff to go to. Okay. So if we start and we look at kind of the world uh, before 1492 or even before the 1500s, where is the center of trade? India, Indian Ocean. That's the best place to go. What are they trading there? Spices, gold, right? Silks, the best goods in the world. Marco Polo gets to China, finds these goods, brings them back to Europe, and all the rich people go, listen, I want silk. I want spices. I want gold. So they send a bunch of people out to try and find an easy passage to get to this great trading market. There's Bartholomew Diaz, there's Vasco da Gama from, brand, from different countries. The most famous is 1492. Columbus died thinking he had discovered some path to India. When reality, Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian, realizes later he has discovered a whole new world. This is a key concept. What do Europeans want? They want silk, spices, luxury goods. They want luxury goods, so they send people out. The most important person of the exploration era is in the 1400s. Who's the most important person? Henry the Navigator. He's uh, the navigator. He's the king of what country? The biggest leaders early on, Portugal, right? And they make all the great advancements. Uh, what's the technology? Caravel, Astrobe, I usually do compass and maps. Caravel, compass and maps, technology is a key concept. Uh, and, and one big one is they wrote all their journals down. Portalands. It's important because these early Portuguese explorers write all their journals down, journal, write all these down. Um, so the next group of explorers, people like Columbus, who's born in Italy, not a place for exploration early on. He reads them, becomes fascinated by them, wants to be great. If we look at the countries, the first country to dominate is Portugal. Where do they go? They go to the Indian Ocean, they go to Africa, they go to South America. They're going to be the ones with Brazil. What's the next country that comes along? Spain. Spain's the next country. Where do they dominate heavily? South America, the Caribbean, <laughs> Florida. They also go to Africa and the Indian Ocean. What's the next country to come along? Keep moving in Europe. It's the Netherlands. They're probably the best. Why are the Netherlands so important to trade? Why, why do they want to trade so much? Because they're tiny. Um, they trade. South Africa. They go to the New World. Most famous colony of the Netherlands is? New Amsterdam which will become New York after the next dominant force. Next guy is really, I guess France is next, but the next guy is Britain. The last guy is Britain. When the big boy enters the stage, they dominate everything. They take over many of these old colonies. And that's why they will become the imperial dynasty. It's very important to note that because of, because of exploration, we get imperialism. And when all of these different countries throw in Germany, Throw in Russia, throw in Italy. When they all stay claiming land over the world, what's going to happen? 
conflict, right? It leads to rivalry between these countries. It leads to anger. It'll eventually lead to war. Another key point is that we finally move to the Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic Trade Center. All right. What's trade? First off, we have the uh, the Colombian Exchange. Goods that go from Europe to America. We can include and always think animals: horses, cows, pigs. Always think animals. North America doesn't have a lot. What comes from America to Europe? What's the most important crop? If you're Irish, potato. Um. What else? Tomato, corn, maize, uh, squash. There's another big one. Oh, what? That it's not food, but what else do the Europeans bring with them? Disease. Disease. What disease is number one? Smallpox. I think smallpox is number one. Um, probably measles number two. So they start to build this Atlantic economy. When we look at how the Atlantic economy uh, shapes up, you learned this last year in American. What is the uh, what is the econ what do we call it? How does it look? Triangle trade. Triangle trade. One of the keys of the triangle trade is slaves. Why does Europe suddenly have a thirst for slaves in the New World? What are they doing that requires slaves? Plantations. Giant commercial farms. What are they making? Uh, sugar, luxury goods. Sugar, tobacco. Uh, they're growing, uh, uh, or they're making rum from the sugar, right? All of these goods are what they want. Coffee is a big one. So slaves and these rich goods. This leads to, this plantation leads to new elites. You guys remember talking about the nobles of the robe? These are the modern day Medici families. They make money by banking. They make money by banking. They make money by trading. They live in the port cities. They don't have old money. So the fact that we don't have, let's connect it back to Reformation. Let's cluster it with that. The fact that we have new money, not old power, what eventually is going to happen with these new nobles? They are going to flip back to Reformation. Flip back to Reformation. Look at the clusters. Challenge the status quo. Because now they have money like everybody else. Now they want respect and power. Those nobles with the sword? No, 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 no. no, no. We're going to take them down. Get a couple more minutes. Nobles of robe, no elites. And guys, if you think I've talked about a lot or covered a lot of things, they are all key concepts. There is nothing on the board for Reformation or now that is not testable. There's nothing extra. Columbia Exchange. Uh, oh, 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 mm, what's the big one? With the Atlantic economy for countries, the idea that trade is now most important. Trading a lot allows you to gain money. What's this concept? Yes. Mercantilism. Mercantilism. If you want to constantly have a source of trade overseas, after you discover the new lands, what do you do? If you always want a market for your goods, you need a colony. If you want to synthesize with the future, the first thing we do with those colonies is we get food. Late 1600s. What's the next era with food? The agricultural revolution in the 1700s. What's after that? So we get food from them. If we go past the agricultural revolution and into the industrial revolution, what do we get from them? From colonies. Raw resources. Raw resources. All of this stuff overlaps and connects. Let me figure out Columbus, Colombian Exchange, trade. The last thing is that in order to get from exploration 
two colonies to actual domination. It's all about exploitation. And why are Europeans able to exploit indigenous populations and colonize them? Number one reason is because specifically, he said technology, specifically military technology, right? Military technology. Military technology, exploitation, economic destruction, and the first one, the very first bonus for the white Europeans was what? Disease. Hope you can read that. Do you guys have any major questions about exploration? I hope today helped, guys. Today's a great day in class. We're killing uh, 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 Stalin. Yes, please. No, we're not killing Stalin. Hitler. No, we won't even kill him there.